So today we've got a super important anatomy lesson to take you through, which has huge implications for physiotherapy. Let's dive in. Hey guys, Khaled here. Welcome back to Clinical Physio. So why do we see so many dislocations at the shoulder or glenohumeral joint? Let's look at some anatomy to show you why. So ultimately, the shoulder joint or the glenohumeral joint is a ball and socket joint, as we call it, whereby we have the head of the humerus articulating with the glenoid fossa. So the humeral head is our ball and the glenoid fossa is our socket. And we can see here how the humeral head clearly sits in that socket of the glenoid fossa, which is part of the scapula or shoulder blade bone. Now, the key principle is that actually there is only a very small proportion of the humeral head which is ever in contact with the glenoid. And you can see this here, whereby the amount that's actually really in contact is kind of just this small section. And in fact, it's often said that only one third of the humeral head is ever in contact with that glenoid fossa. So rather than being a traditional ball and socket joint, we sometimes kind of refer to the shoulder or the glenohumeral joint as a ball and saucer joint because you can see that the saucer or the glenoid fossa is so shallow that it's a little bit like a ball rolling around a saucer. Eventually it will fall off because the saucer is so flat and not very deep. Now the body is clever, it does try and adapt so we do have a, a another structure to try and help improve the depth of that glenoid fossa and that is the glenoid labrum so this is a cartilaginous ring that runs around the glenoid fossa and effectively it helps to try and deepen that fossa you can see that without it it's actually really really shallow as we said before and so here we can see how the humeral head fits in to the glenoid fossa or that ball and saucer as we said and then we have that labrum to try and deepen it a little bit further. So why do we have such a shallow socket or saucer when it comes to the shoulder joint? Well it's so that we can allow for large degrees of movement of the shoulder joint it's really brilliant that we can move our arm in all these different directions and how we can rotate it as well because it allows for so much more functional movement. And actually that mobility is really, really key. But as you've seen, it comes at the price of stability. So whilst that shallow socket allows us to move our arm loads, it does mean that the shoulder is more prone to dislocations than the other key ball and socket joint in the body, which is the hip. And in fact, let's take a look at the hip now. So the hip joint, the other major ball and socket joint in the body. So if we zoom in, we can see that this is the ball and socket joint between the femur, also known as the thigh bone, and the acetabulum of the pelvis. And we can automatically just see, even from this angle here, how much deeper the acetabulum is relative to the glenoid of the scapula for what we saw earlier with the shoulder. Now, not only is the acetabulum much deeper, but just look how much more of the femur fits inside that acetabular socket compared to the shoulder. And you can see just how far in it goes. It's almost, you know, almost half of the actual femur itself. And it's almost 80% of the actual articular surface of that head of femur. And actually, if we now bring them side by side, you can see just how much of a difference there is between the two. Here's how much the head of the humerus is in contact with the glenoid fossa. And here is how much of the head of femur is in contact with the acetabulum. So this means that the hip is a far more stable structure. It sacrifices mobility for stability. Therefore, the hip doesn't dislocate as much as the shoulder does, but whereas we can move our shoulder around all over the place, the hip clearly can't move as far. But that's the trade-off that the shoulder gives you. It sacrifices stability for mobility. It helps our function, but it doesn't help with the rate of dislocation. 
Now what we find at the shoulder is that an anterior dislocation where the head of humerus comes forward relative to the glenoid fossa is much more common than a posterior dislocation. And you'll find that the anterior dislocations of the shoulder most commonly happen with a trauma in this particular position when the shoulder is abducted with external rotation of the shoulder. And you'll see this all the time when you have rugby players, for example, who fall on the floor and they find that their shoulder is in this awkward position as they land. So listen out for that mechanism of injury for the shoulder and don't forget about that combined abduction and external rotation position. And if you wanted to test for anterior shoulder instability with your patient, we've got loads of tests that you can use on the Clinical Physio YouTube channel. Most commonly used is the anterior apprehension test, and you can see a link for that video up here. So I really hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please support us by smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Check out our Instagram, at Clinical Physio, and we've got loads of resources on our website, clinicalphysio.com. I'm Khalid, see you soon here on Clinical Physio.